Welcome to the Life Handmade Podcast with Scrapbook.com. This is the show for paper crafters, and I'm your host today, Jessica Harrington. In this episode of Life Handmade, we sit down to chat remotely with a dear friend of SBC, Amy Tan, known to most in the scrapbooking world as Amy Tangerine. She has had many scrapbooking lines over the past decade. She was born and raised in Chicago, and Amy discovered her love of designing early, learning to sew as a high schooler, and within five years, founding a very successful t-shirt line called Amy Tangerine. Her collections were featured in hundreds of high-end retail outlets, including Bloomingdale's, Neiman Marcus, and Barney's. In 2007, her business expanded into scrapbooking, and she began teaching creative classes all over the world. She now stays busy with creative collaborations, ranging from custom scrapbooks to celebrity events to consulting services, and you can find her current American Crafts collection, Picnic in the Park, at scrapbook.com. When she's not at home in Los Angeles with her husband, their son, Jack, and two dogs, she can be found cherishing and Instagramming those little moments in life. So that's the intro and welcome to Amy Tan. Hi, Jess. How are you? Good. It's so good to see you. We've known each other for so long and this is so nice. This is lovely. Yes. And you look beautiful in your virtual uh, way. And I like seeing all the crafty stuff in the background. And we'll show that in the little video that we do afterwards. But it's very inspirational behind you. Thank you. I love the... Is that washi tape in the background? Oh, yeah. Is that a roll? Okay. Nice. And it's and it's organized with Roy G. Biv. It looks very fun. It's the only way to go. Okay. So we're going to go back in time. We're just going to start from the beginning. What is that first first memory or experience with crafting? My mom was always very creative. And on weekends, we would do these projects. We would go to the craft store and sometimes the bead store and find these little things we could work on together. And I remember making friendship bracelets. Do you remember the knotted ones with the different embroidery flosses? And it was just one of those funny things that got me hooked because I think it was a way of transforming something, a simple piece of string, into a bracelet that not only could you wear, but you could share with others. And I think that the crafty bug got me pretty early with that. And then I remember collecting stickers and erasers and pencils and all kinds of stationary supplies, and also tie-dyeing Mm t-shirts, just making stuff and spending that quality time with my mom. As an only child, I was bored a lot. So I think that they tried to keep me occupied with different projects. My dad is an engineer or was an engineer, and he really got into this idea of hey, you can take something and make it whatever you want it to be. And right. you can create something that, you know, hasn't been done before. Nice. And then in the high school, it transitioned, obviously, to close, right? And then how? tell us a little bit more about that in case people don't know about the t-shirt design and your love of design and how that kind of came to be. Right. So throughout growing up, I think that I always had creativity in my back pocket. I was writing down quotes and notebooks, passing notes to my friends and decorating the notes as prettily as possible with Mm -hmm. markers and, you know, colored designs. And I think that that lent itself to me going into high school, wanting to just get the schoolwork done and then setting aside time for or infusing time to get creative as much as I could. And so I ended up finishing a lot of my major, uh, the things that I had to do, the required classes. And my senior year, I had all these electives that I could take. And I took sewing and I ended up making a pair of boxer shorts, a (laughs) pillow, and then I made my prom dress. And I think that because I found this Jessica McClintock dress that I could not afford, right? And it was like $350 and It was either that or a Nicole Miller dress. I can't even remember now, but it was inspiration from both of those designers that were really, to me, very high end. And I didn't want to spend that kind of money. So I went to the fabric store. I bought two patterns 
and this champagne colored fabric oh. and ended up making my prom dress. And in the process, I had a friend whose mom was a substitute teacher for one of my sewing classes. And she asked if I would make her daughter's prom dress too. And literally three weeks, you know, to go till prom. And so she dreamed up this design and we were able to make it happen. And I think that the power of being able to take a piece of fabric and transform it into something that you wear for an occasion that, you know, you probably remember for the rest of your life. You probably don't go to too many proms. And I feel so bad for the people who missed out on know. You know, so many amazing life experiences this year because mm-hmm. of COVID-19. I think that there's so so much that we're probably not really, uh, I guess, aware of, of the effects of that. But I think mm-hmm. that people definitely made the most of it. You know, we feel so connected being online and everything. But prom was definitely one of those highlights. And maybe it was because I was with all my friends and it was a great gathering of people and you just have a really good time. And it was a really special almost turning point in our lives Mm -hmm. where it was a great way to say goodbye to the high school friends and to really enjoy and be, be present and be in a dress that I made. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, just there's such a loss around gathering right now. So yeah, those things that are, that didn't get to happen this year for sure. Okay. Do you have a picture of this dress? I do. Okay, I have to, got I'll pull to it out for this. you. Okay. Yeah. We can maybe add it um, to the show notes if you can get that to us. I really want to see it because sh- I remember liking the champagne color too. Um, so I can totally, I, I feel like I can picture it. <laughs> and I find it very, um, not odd, like very interesting that almost immediately when you did this first project, right in the very same moments, someone asked you to do it. And it was, was that like, when you look back, was that maybe like your first inclination of like, I could do a business? Like this could be, I, I'm so good at design that maybe it could be a business? Well, I, let's be clear. I wasn't that good. Okay. okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, I basically took two patterns that I found right. at the fabric store and put them together. And I think that I really uh, found that it was one of those things I felt very proud of. And I didn't think that it was going to be a business, but there was a spark that was lit inside of me okay. that made me feel as though it was a valuable asset to have. And it could be something that was shared that somebody would also appreciate and compensate for Mm -hmm. my time. In college, I ended up sort of creating a business around it where I had these business cards made for custom designs because people had fraternity formals that they were attending and places they needed to go, you know, Greek events where dresses needed to be made unique yes exactly they wanted it to be different and around the same time I grew up you know around the same time that Titanic came out or I was in college at that time so I had a girlfriend who wanted this Titanic dress for this formal she was attending in Tennessee or something and it just yeah it was really fun and it's one of those things that you experience and you realize that there's something there And it motivates you in a way that at the time it was just fun and I got paid for it. You know, I didn't get paid much. I probably honestly made $5 an hour, maybe a little bit less. Even of love. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Oh my goodness. I actually did not know about this dress thing. So that has been really interesting for me to learn. I had no idea it started with prom dresses. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, you're an author too. And the book Craft a Life You Love, it has those little tidbits of everything from positivity to infusing, like I use that word infusing creativity into your everyday life and and documenting as a form of creative therapy. So tell me, that was a few years ago, right? That's already been a few years. Yeah, it has. So I actually originally did it self-published because okay. uh, just a little backstory. In 2016, I found out early on we had decided that we wanted a second child, and at the time Jack was about almost three, so mm-hmm. he was like two and a half, and we decided it was time to try for a second. Uh, before that, I was so wrapped up in this, I guess, postpartum 
type of situation where it wasn't postpartum depression. I later have found out that it was probably postpartum anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it lasted quite a while because I really didn't know my footing around balancing everything. And I think that having the pressure of being somebody who is creative and paid to be creative full time, but then not finding that energy or the things that inspired me in the old ways, I needed to get back to myself. Mm -hmm. And it just took me a little bit longer than I think maybe most people. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. It was just the journey that I had to go on. So anyway, we were ready to have another child and I got pregnant pretty quickly. Okay. And it was something we were obviously very much looking forward to. But at my eight week appointment, the doctor said that there was no heartbeat. And it was just a devastating realization of your plans and dreams and hopes shattering without even really realizing that that was a possibility. And it was not because I didn't know anybody who hadn't, you know, who had miscarriage. I knew people who had miscarriages before, but I didn't for some reason even have it on my radar. No, and because we you had Jack successfully, yeah, and you right, did. and he wasn't he wasn't planned, so yeah, that so like, was oh. a, a nice, unexpected, yes, surprise, of course. But I didn't realize the feelings that would come from that miscarriage, and it was my mm-hmm. first one. And I subsequently went on to have several more, but I'll get back to that. So, okay, I think in the interim when you when you think your life is going to go a certain way and you find out some news that you're going to have this other life come in and, you know, for the next nine months, your life is going to look a certain way. And because that was shattered, I really needed something to, I wanted something to give birth to. And I had been thinking about a book for a long time. And so I decided that this was the time to get it all down on paper I had conversations with a couple friends of mine who had Mm self-published and I was able to get an editor. I hired an editor who told me, you'll never write a book until you write a bad first draft. And after you write that bad first draft, you just hand it to me. And it was interesting. Yeah, it was a really big permission slip for me to say, I have had all these thoughts, experiences throughout my life that maybe somebody else can extract some wisdom from. Mm -hmm. And because of that and the support that I had in spilling out the the pages and the words, I was able to get everything together pretty quickly. And in less than nine months, we had a book that I hired somebody to lay out the interior. I hired a book cover designer who was amazing. And I just had this feeling inside of me that I needed to share this project. And if only 100 people read it and enjoyed it, that would be enough. Mm -hmm. And honestly, with doing a self-published project, it was really the way to go for me because I didn't know how to write a book proposal. I didn't have publishers knocking down my door. And it was a great experience going through that process. And it was a very, I think, therapeutic experience of being able to write down a lot of these feelings and thoughts and sharing these experiences in hopes that one person would be affected positively. Mm-hmm. And it, and then it stayed true to what you wanted it to be. It might not, it might have needed to morph and then turn into something that maybe wasn't that catalyst, that reason that you needed to give birth to this project. I'm glad that you did it that way. That's that's very inspirational for sure. Um, so those concepts in the book, those are a few, few years ago you did this. Are those still some of the themes in your life or are there new themes in your life? Are there new kind of mantras and um, things that you're focusing on and living into? Yeah, I think we're ever evolving beings and we are on this path, hopefully towards growth and coming home closer to our authentic selves. So a lot of it has definitely stayed true. Uh, Just really quickly, three weeks after we had released the book in the 
in January of 2017, mm -hmm. it hit Amazon's number one best-selling list. I remember in that. Two categories. Thank yes, you. Yes. Yeah, and it was so cool watching it climb and climb and climb. And honestly, before I think it was ranked like 1500 <laughs> on Amazon, and then it got up to like number 11 overall on Amazon, which was so crazy and nuts. I thought that was a glitch. I thought something was wrong. No. <laughs> but Reset. then, yeah, but then um, shortly after that, I was actually approached by publishers. Okay. And so I went with Abrams, my book, I found a pub, uh, sorry, an agent, a literary agent who's amazing. And she shopped my book around and I went with Abrams and they repackaged it. It's nice. color. It's beautiful. It was available at Barnes and Noble because previously it was only on Amazon and it was a great experience overall. And I think that the concepts are everlasting. I think that people can extract what they want from it. The permission slip is something that, you know, we can all recognize, especially at this point in our lives where I think women in general tend to give of themselves to others before they nurture themselves. And this idea of self-care and really putting our hobbies not first, but making sure that they are valued by not only us, but the people around us, hmm. because they are things that make us who we are. And I found that when I was in the thick of it with an infant, mm -hmm. I wasn't carving out 10 minutes a day to be creative, right? And you were just trying to go from moment to moment, keeping this baby alive and all those thoughts that you have. And even if you have a great support system, which I did... I wasn't almost allowing myself to take time in the studio and I would feel this tremendous guilt around when I went back to work very soon after, too soon mm, after, mm. and that I wasn't spending enough time with him. And then and I would feel guilty spending too much time with him and not enough time on work. So it was this delicate balance. And what I found is that really instead of trying to achieve this idea of balance, it's more about harmony in our lives. Mm. And that's something that wasn't included in the book. But I now looking back on it, you know, the during the process, it's something that I've realized over the years and through my experience is that harmony plays a huge role in my life. I'm a Libra, so I always thought it was balance. And it turns it's out harmony. There's, yeah, there's no such thing, right? It's always a juggle. You're always, you're never going to arrive at this point where I feel, you feel completely centered and balanced and it's completely sustainable for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I think that you can have that or a resemblance of that, but it's more through the lens of harmony as opposed to perfectly balanced. That sounds more achievable and more peaceful too, because balance, you think of kind of the scale and that rigidity and metal and harmony feels light and peaceful and like a butterfly. Um, I love that. I love that concept. I haven't really thought about that, like balance versus harmony. So looking back when you think it, so you said, I went back to work too early. And it, yes, we know that you do creative things in your work, but you said you weren't really infusing that time for your true creativity. When you think back to that fourth trimester where you talked about that postpartum anxiety, do you think that it would have been shortened and lessened if you had infused and remembered why you create for you? Was that missing for too long, maybe? It was something that I just didn't allow myself to fully dive into. And I had to reach for pockets of time here and there and encouragement from my husband because he could probably tell I was going a little crazy and he would definitely encourage going back into the studio, making something. I would have, you know, Jack in the little, I don't know, one of those seats that you put on the yeah. floor and they're belted, you know, he's belted in. And there were moments of that, but it wasn't until I fully allowed myself to have that permission to say, you know, mama needs a moment. I never heard my mom say that. And wow. Yeah. And it's something that I think because culturally too, growing up, I feel like my parents and probably my grandparents, because both my parents worked. So I was really, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And it's something that I only brought up 
recently is that I actually didn't know any English going into school and I never went to preschool. Oh, wow. I just went right into kindergarten and I basically learned English from Sesame Street, I think watching TV. So they were really afraid that I would walk into this classroom and not know what was going on or anything. But they also didn't have the resources to say, oh, yeah, she needs to be enrolled in English as a second language or anything. They just like threw me in. And figure it out. Right. And so I guess back then, you know, it was really a focus on sacrifice. And I think that the culture of being born here in the U.S. from Mm -hmm. immigrant parents you're taught to really work hard and, you know, the struggle is part of it. And I don't know that that's necessarily something that I want to infuse in my children. I do think that I do believe in hard work. I do believe in happiness. And I, I think there's a lot of things that come with struggle. There's a lot of lessons that you can learn, but I don't want my, my kids to say, oh my gosh, my mom sacrificed all this for me and lost a part of herself. Right. Right. So you were way. able to really own that and give yourself permission. So how will things look differently in the future for you? Because you said my kids. Right. So I am pregnant right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> Finally, after uh, this long journey that was painful. And I know a lot of women struggle with you know infertility and mm-hmm. loss in different ways. And I really feel for people who have to go through some of these trials and really uh, hardships. And uh, after four miscarriages in four years, we pretty much surrendered to the idea that Jack was going to be an only child. I'm an only child, so I didn't want that for him, (laughs) to be honest. yeah, It was me putting my selfish needs onto him. But then once I released that and was able to surrender the idea of he'll be fine, no matter matter if he's just him or has a sibling or not, I... It was crazy because we had really just kind of given up. Mm -hmm. And um, then I I had to cancel a bunch of events or I think a lot of things were canceled because of coronavirus. Yes. And um, yeah, on April 1st, I found out that I was pregnant. And the funny thing is, April 1st is 11 years after our first date. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So it was... A really interesting, and obviously it's April Fool's Day too, which yeah. which was canceled this year because hello, this whole no year has been pretty much trips. a joke, yeah. right? Exactly, and it was just the most beautiful, you know, miracle that we just had not expected. And I have been, you know, the first trimester was rough, but mm. I am feeling so grateful. And I think that if we are able to give ourselves grace and surrender these ideas that really the outcomes of our lives will turn out better than we had ever imagined and that we could have ever planned for. And Mm -hmm. it's at a time where there's so much darkness, but there's this bright spot that we're able to really hold on to. And I'm, I'm so grateful. And it comes with a lot of grace that this baby is already so loved, obviously. Yes. But I am definitely going to take the time because as you know, it goes by really fast Mm -hmm. and I'm going to savor. I'm going to take my 2019 word of savor and carry it with me and take a proper maternity leave, give myself that time and give my family that time too. Because what a Mm -hmm. gift, right? To be able to recognize that early. Yes. Your beautiful rainbow baby. Yes. Conceived during COVID time. (laughs) Well, it was right before. Right I mean, before. I guess even, <laughs> right when we started lockdown, oh, you know, geez, I think Louise. there's also something crazy magical about our lives before. I don't know if it was as sustainable as I thought it mm. would be, right? Yeah, because true, people had true. told me, I had a bunch of wise mentors tell me, you really need to slow down. You really need yeah. to take some time for yourself. You really need to not travel so much. You really need to be home. You know, I've got this. Right, exactly. And look, as women, as mothers, as the heroes in our own hearts, we have to take a pause sometimes Mm -hmm. and question whether we are doing things that are in alignment for the greater good. Right. Or if we're just going with the flow because we've 
just been used to that, right? Like January a hamster wheel that just keeps well, going, exactly. and going and going and going. Yeah, and I think there's some parts in our lives or phases and seasons in our lives where we go through that need to be that way. Of course. To a certain extent. And my 20s were like that, but I don't know that that needed to be carried on and it didn't need to be a habit. No, it's not. It's not <laughs> sustainable. No, it I'm, isn't. I'm so thankful, and I'm so thankful. Just, I just am so pleased. I was, I was so happy to like see that you had conceived and that you were. You're doing the fall, right? Uh, early December. Early December, come winter baby. I was just beyond because I hadn't known about your four miscarriages. I'm so happy for you and your family because Jack and my Oliver are the same age. And so that's going to be so, 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 so fun. Are you going to find out uh, the gender? Yes. Yes. Okay. We will. And you'll do like maybe a reveal on Instagram or is it going to be a secret? I think so. No, I think we'll we'll do some sort of reveal. Okay. I don't know how to do it. I mean, maybe just pop a balloon or something. But I think that sharing that joy, yes. especially during this time, is yes. something that I want to be able to do in a fun way. Obviously, socially distanced. But yes. Uh, I don't, we're not getting family together to have a party or anything. We are definitely just going to make some sort of announcement. Okay, good. Well, I'll be watching and waiting for that for sure. (laughs) So I want to make sure that we have time for some of my favorite questions that I try to ask in every session. And I know that creativity and uh, making things with your hands have, like we've learned, long been a part of your life. So this is going to be a really interesting series of questions because there's a lot of creativity and handmade stuff in your life. So what is the most meaningful handmade gift that you have ever received from someone else? To be honest, I think that the drawings that my son makes and the way he has these ideas circulating and how he communicates on paper and it's so simple, right? right? It could just be a handmade note. One of the things that he made recently after one of my doctor's appointments, because unfortunately, JC can't come in with me, right. but he takes me, drops me off, does the grocery shopping. I go in myself, have the mask and... And then we come home and he has written us the most beautiful notes. One of them, I don't even remember what it says, but it's so cute. He's like, I love you, mama and dada and the baby too. And he'll draw, he'll illustrate something. And he wrote, (laughs) he drew me sleeping on the sofa because that happened a lot in the first trimester. And then he drew a no TV sign because Uh we are trying to limit his screen time Mm -hmm. even more so now. And uh, it was just a really... and. Uh, JC on a Zoom call, all right, because oh, that's gosh. what he does for work at home. And so, and then he drew a plant. So it's just a funny little handmade thing that he probably doesn't really even think that much of. No. But it was so meaningful and special. It's just his little seven year old, seven, right? He's six, yeah. He's six, yeah. six year old Norman Rockwell rendition of what uh, coronavirus life is right now. <laughs> Well, I think there's just so, I mean, handmade objects by anybody, right? They can hold such special value to whoever you're giving them to or showing them to. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I mean, I dare anybody to look at that picture and not smile, right? Oh, totally. (laughs) That like is just... If we do you have that photo? Could we also Yeah, that it's one on too? Instagram. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. We'll have to grab that and put that in the show notes for others. And that's like the ultimate thing that you could frame and put in the new baby's room because it shows how much that, that they were loved well before that they entered the world. Like that's so special for the new baby to have as an heirloom for sure. So what is the most meaningful handmade project that you've created? And I'm very eager to hear what this is because you've been creating with your hands for so long. So how would you pick? Yeah, there's so many, but I think recently it would probably be this scrapbook that I was commissioned to do by a uh, son and daughter of somebody who has had an impact on their lives. Um, Mm -hmm. It was their parents' 60th anniversary, and I created this scrapbook album to their style and their liking. It's an Academy Award winner. So it was sort of surreal to, because it was a secret project too, they had to find out when their parents were going to be out of town. And so we basically 
had to sneak into their house. This was in 2019, so it was oh a while ago. Oh my goodness! Like a yeah, secret we snuck in, raid. Yeah, so we went into their house and we took photos. I had a photographer with me who took photos of the Academy Award, and we went through their old photos together. And it was so wonderful being able to put together a scrapbook and something that was so special for somebody who you literally cannot buy anything for. Right. Right. I mean, they have had a very successful, beautiful life. They have this wonderful family and they were actually collecting photos. He was kind of doing his own archiving Uh as a way of maybe presenting something to his wife, but the kids wanted to intercept it and sort of do it in a way where they could present it as a gift to them. And it was really magical too, because you have this idea of what scrapbookers and people who treasure their memories about how they live, right? Mm -hmm. And walking into their house and seeing family photos and the, just this, m- these mementos of a well-lived life that's mm-hmm. very full, very vibrant, full of love. And there was this floor-to-ceiling collage that he had made for his wife for their 40th or 50th anniversary, which was just mind-blowing. Or maybe it was a birthday present, but it was a collage. You know how you used to do with yeah. all the photos and stuff? Kids, grandkids, you know, it didn't matter the time of the photo. He just put it together in this floor to ceiling, like our probably, f- yeah, three feet wide framed gorgeousness that he had oh made secretly for her. And that to me is just one of those moments that really ring true to me because the power of the handmade paired with the photos and memories of people's lives is something that you cannot bottle up. And if right. you could, you could sell it for a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. There's it's priceless. Like it is. it's absolutely it's so I love the secrecy and the like detectiveness <laughs> and the like the intrigue and oh that's so exciting. And then the whole thing is a secret. And it's for the person that has everything but needs that. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So the kids videoed it for their anniversary party and it was just so magical because I got these text messages and it was one of those moments that, you know, they're in tears looking through these photos that, I mean, they eloped basically to Vegas. Oh man. And they've lived in whatever year it was. Right. And six they years. have, yeah, I, it's just incredible. And they have these black and white photos of them standing by their car, right? Just these classic photos. And I, I don't know if I can share this. I can probably share it now, but there was a photo that I have to go through them with, the people who are giving them to me. And sometimes right. I'll have to take notes or they'll give me notes. But this one photo of the dad laughing next to somebody on a boat mm-hmm. and they called him Marty. And I look at the picture, it's <gasps> Martin Scorsese. Oh, no big deal. <laughs> so I was like, okay, like, yeah, How do I... this is what I'm mm-hmm. doing right now. I am making sure that this is part of yeah yeah. (laughs) the great thing about it is they were they wanted it to be super something that they would enjoy and they have this distinct style Mm -hmm. where it's very simplistic but very modern and very sophisticated okay so clean so no yeah no stickers hardly any stickers a lot of negative space a lot of black stamping Mm. um, just a little bit of washi tape here and there but very simple washi tape right okay yeah, and we only incorporated a little touch of gold and silver in, in yeah. very small quantities. I mean, I had to take away a lot of things, and it looked like it needed more embellishment to me right. because I like that thing, but it but wasn't my scrapbook. Their, their look. They and had the yeah. way you describe it. It sounds like um, an homage to like when you think of old, old, old photo albums. What would they have had? They would have had negative space, black ink of some sort and maybe that washi tape look of that just little bits of tape frayed and gold and silver probably and so that that's what I'm like seeing in my head I can almost see it but it's made in the modern day yeah and it was so one of those things that I had pictured in my head but I wasn't sure if I could pull off and to be honest I don't think they thought I could pull it off because every single one of my pages has color and embellishments and stickers 
And they came over several times just to make sure that usually I can just send them a picture, but they came over. uh, I don't usually let clients see the album before it's done. And they came over twice, but they were so happy. They were blown away and so pleased. They're like, keep going. With the result, yeah. How many pages would you estimate this album had in it? Was it a really large one? You know what? It was more than 40, but less than 50. I can't remember what we actually finally landed on. Nice, solid. Yeah, and it was one of these beautiful custom albums that I had ordered. And we put it on top with the glassine paper over it. Nice. And I don't really like that style of album, but they didn't want plastic. They That's what they wanted. were very true to staying uh, true to who the couple was, right? right. Their parents were. And it was something that they, yeah, it was, it was something that was cherished and hopefully they still look at it because I just it it yeah. I'm I saw sure they do. I'm sure well, they do. I most recently watched the Academy Awards in January and I saw him in the audience and I was like, oh, there he is. I would like, as if he's an old friend because I've right. seen so many pictures You're of like, him. Yeah. <laughs> no, and yeah, you've sat and you've been taped and glued yeah. and like yeah. worked on his photos. Yeah, you feel very intimate um, with someone that you've made a scrapbook for, for sure. Absolutely. Oh, goodness. Well, I could talk to you forever. And sometimes our conversations are so harried because we see each other at show and it's been nice just to visit with you for this amount of time. I've learned so much about you and I'm sure our audience has too. We really appreciate you chatting with us today. Of course. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for this special episode of Life Handmade as we had the opportunity to speak with Amy Tan chatting about everything from her love of fashion and design to her belief that creative inspiration can be derived from that everyday beauty that we're surrounded with. Remember to go to check out the show notes and you can go to www.scrapbook.com forward slash podcast for more info as well. And remember, scrapbook.com carries over 40,000 unique items and it is the number one online store for paper crafters. When you shop at scrapbook.com, you'll enjoy award-winning customer service, great prices, a huge selection of products, and super fast shipping. You also benefit from nearly 200,000 real product reviews from crafters like you. You'll find endless inspiration and meaningful connection in the scrapbook.com, the forums, the gallery, and you can even take those free online classes from the comfort of your own home anytime as well. Be sure to subscribe to the Life Handmade podcast in that favorite app that you enjoy your podcasts in. And please, please, please consider leaving a review for the podcast because it really does help other paper crafters find it just like you did. Happiness is Life Handmade. I drop doodles of eccentric faces in the margin spaces of impact.